Dooby dooby doo. Okay, you guys gotta let me know when you're on there. Just post a comment or something, and I'll know what you're talking. About. I'll know that you're there. <clears throat> oh, my hair. Ah, oh, there we go. I got one viewer. Who's watching? I can. I got you on my phone, so when you make a post, I'll know who's who's on there. So just let me know when you're ready, and I shall begin to elaborate on a. Ah, oh, hello, Karen. How you doing today? I am going to talk about I'm waiting on the rest of the people in Missouri to get on there. Patricia's supposed to get on, Melissa's supposed to get on, and then I'm going to talk about uh, what I'm writing on now with Blind. Uh, and it kind of started when when you guys came down to uh, Melissa's house. <clears throat> Some of what uh, Sean said was kind of the impetus for this. And uh, I've kind of Made it go forward. I think it'll be cool. Ah, there's my man. <laughs> Glad you guys are on. You're gonna like this, Sean. I think I sent it to you, if I'm not mistaken. Um, okay, Melissa, are you on here too? This is gonna be weird. See if I can see myself on here. Well, I sure as hell can. Okay, I'm just gonna start talking. So the uh, the uh, couple of months ago, when all of us were together at Melissa's house, Sean made a comment when his presentation, and he said that emir means is is a wave or a screamer or a sound wave, and uh, it immediately caught my imagination. But I wasn't really sure what to do with it. I knew there was something in the in the uh, overall scheme of things with that tied together but I wasn't sure exactly how the uh, the creation the origin story uh, given in the Prosetta for the most part seems like this wonderful tale but I come across some research by a professor at MIT named Robert England that really tied the idea of Ymir as screamer or sound wave and the origin story of, of the uh, Prosetta and the Ossetru, it really tied it together. And I'm going to do some reading, so you just have to bear with me on that, but I think it's sufficiently captivating that you're going to enjoy it. The, um, I think we find at the beginning of the of the tales of the origin this wonderful understanding of the dispersal of energy. And that's a very crucial point when you're talking about the creation. There's been a very I've always had a very difficult time of it just this huge being just originated. And then another huge being just originated, and then a couple more, and then it just kept multiplying. Well, they just started out of nothingness. And I don't know if it was from uh being conditioned all of my life that from the from the christian stories of well he spoke and it was there was life or so and so and you know so you you always look for that kind of outside source of energy to spark any kind of existence <laughs> see the um the thing about this this dispersal of energy idea that i have with regards to the creation myth and the origins of austria is um it kind of starts with being blind we seem to be blind to the flows of energy around us and I really touched base on it with life and the love of life. I've, I've, I've noted that uh, birds can find their way using magnetic fields. And I read the other day that foxes can do the same thing. As the, the further north they go, they get a dark circle in their eyes that allows them to perceive magnetic fields 
and allows them to hunt prey under the snow. So I've got now all of a sudden two very different animal species that, that can see these flows of energy across the flow of the earth, the surface of the earth. <laughs> in ancient mythologies, in several ancient mythologies, not just ours, the language of the birds, I think, is that kind of representation of an understanding of the flows of energy. Okay, that that and an understanding of the runes is what allows Cone Rig to shed the cone and earn the title of Rig himself. That's a hell of a thing to promise somebody that if they begin to understand these flows of energies, if they know how to focus and scatter them with the use of the runes, that they might fight for and earn the title of Rig himself to ascend to something much higher than they currently are, just, just kind of shuffling across the surface of the earth. That's a hell of a thing to promise. When all of the other promises of all the other religions and faiths have people in robes, sitting cross-legged, muttering om all day long, or praying on their knees, or some other thing, some very simplistic kind of, uh, and here's our religion telling us, you can become a king, you can become something greater. And then you wonder, how the hell is that supposed to happen? I just got to learn the runes, runes and I, I got to see flows of energy? Well, I can see the clouds in the sky, I can see the flow of water, I can see the as I can see the effects of the wind blowing through the tree. I can see a tornado. I can see rain. I can see lightning. But as far, insofar as those flows of energy, spiritual energies are concerned, I may not necessarily be able to see all that. I can kind of read people, kind of know how people are thinking and feeling. That might be something. <laughs> but how does it all start? That's the big thing. How does it all start? So, uh, I see I see. Uh, Master Chim's going to do his thing too. Good on you, buddy. Part of the problem is, is that all of us have jumped feet first into this faith with little or no preparation. Many of us showed up here. For a lot of years, it was the religion with homework. You had to read this book, and you had to read that book, and you had the theologian saying, well, you simply must understand the concepts of high counsel and the heathen worldview to be considered us true. <laughs> hey, man, we jumped in the middle of this feet first. We really didn't know where to look or what to read. And what we were reading really didn't make a lot of sense. And it was the simple, same old recitation of, of uh, the, the gods and what they did in the lore with some kind of fancy thing or... You know, the first one I read was by Kraskova, and she said, run a bath and put some sage and burn some candles. And I'm like, that is not what I want out of this. <laughs> so I began to study for it. We go back to this, like I say, this origin story. See, that origin story contains an idea of entropy and the opposite, opposite of it, the focusing of energy, where we might find an answer. Uh all of the tales of the lore outline the dispersal and the focusing of energy, the understanding of these flows. All of them. I can point it out in every one of them. The individuals who handle it best, we know them as our gods. Right? So that's a pretty simple concept to start with. Uh, but as we move forward and it begins to break down even more and more and more, we, uh, we humanize these things so we might understand them. And then further... They get further humanized and kind of denigrated by the one who does not understand. The uninspired human intellect who does his best to humanize these interactions of the divine because he can't quite grasp it, so he vilifies what he doesn't understand. Uh, don't look near there. It's like a, it's like a protective dyke. A woman in comfortable shoes is saying, don't go near there. Um, <laughs> but it does give us a hint of what we're dealing with. The second part of it is, is that I see that these tales work from the personal, from the cellular, all the way up to the cosmic level. How do you create an understanding of these tales that will sufficiently outline all of these, of this, of this vast range of operation? Um, we see, we, we look at these divine concepts. Sometimes we assign them Jungian archetypes. Uh, we get a glimpse into these processes of life and death, but it's by no means the whole story. And, so what if, what if, with all that in mind, let's go ahead and start at the beginning. And I'm going to read to you, <coughs> excuse me guys. 
I'm going to read to you the prose edit so you know where I'm coming from. Then said Yaphon Har, he fashioned heaven and earth and air and all things which are in them. Well, did I miss a whole part here? I think I did. Sorry. No, nope. looks like I'm doing it right to begin with. Shouldn't have second guessed myself. <laughs> he fashioned heaven and earth and air and all things which are in them. Then spake 3D. The greatest of all this is that he made man and gave him spirit which shall live and never perish. Though the flesh frame rot to mold or burn to ashes and all men shall live. Such as are just in action and with himself he placed in the place he called Gimli. But evil men go to hell and thence down to the misty hell. And that is down in the ninth world. That is probably the only place in the lore you will find a reference to the ninth world as Misty Hell. Most of the other places in the lore you look at, that, you'll you'll find eight realms. That's the the ninth is the Misty Hell. <coughs> Hellheim, as we would call it, I suppose. Niflheim. See, there's a. Um, I'm not going to go into that distinction because it doesn't serve the purpose of what I want to talk about. What I want to talk about is what the beginning was. What was the beginning, or how it began, or what was before it? Har answered. Har means high, as it was told in the Velusva. Earth was the age when nothing was, nor sand, nor sea, nor chilling stream waves. Earth was not found, nor ether earth, a yawning gap, but grass was none. It is the limitless void, the great canyon of nothingness we call Ganunga Gap, which means yawning void or gaping abyss. And perhaps this is the great breath before the action, the calm before the storm, much like the deep breathing exercises we do or we see wise men emulate in their meditative practices. And those breathing practices are an integral part of our ability to harness or understand these flows of energy. <laughs> see, it, uh, it, it helps us focus the idea that we can create the world we would wish to live in. Because what we're talking about here are three beings that were born of a, of a primordial action, according to the second law of thermodynamics, that created the world they would want to live in. And then it continued to fracture. What I'm suggesting is that, once again, it works on the personal level as well as the, as the cosmic level. It was many ages before the earth was shaped that mist world was made, and midmost within it lies the well that is called... I'm going to have to take a course in this because I can't pronounce these things to save my life. The bubbling cauldron, a bubbling boiling spring, Virglmer, and all the rivers that go with it. Yet first was the world in the southern region. The southern region is very important. It's called Muspel. It is light and hot, and that region is glowing and burning and impassable to such as are outlanders and have not their holdings. <laughs> he who sits there at the land's end to defend the land is called Surtur. He brandishes a flaming sword, and at the end of the world he'll go forth and harry and overcome all the gods and burn all the world and tear it all down. The fact that the southern end of the Great Gap is the hot, light place also ties into a concept of hell that I, that I subscribe to. The great ship burials... The barrows were in a north-south orientation, and standing at the door to that barrel, that entrance to the afterlife, that entrance to the tomb, we usually find the idea of hell. And instead of being split down the middle, it was more of a front and back thing, the front of her being the bright, shining, warm goddess facing life, facing south, and behind her to the north was all of the dark, mysterious, decay, decomposition uh, afterlife that we weren't really sure how it goes things that change as energy changes into things we can't begin to comprehend. If a tree could understand that the all of the processes that keep it alive, uh, all the energy that it produces, the oxygen, the shade, the, uh, the life that it supports, when it changes shape, you can't destroy energy. When it is cut down, it is formed into something we might use, or it is used for heat, or it falls over and decays. The energy it changes into is something so alien as that living creature can't seem to understand what that really is. Something along the same lines with us. So if we're entering this dark tomb, especially for ancient and primitive peoples, 
if you're looking at this wonderful, beautiful goddess, the front half of her as a warm, welcoming, kind of inviting thing, it makes that transition somewhat easier. It'd be okay. I'm going to change into something. I'm not sure what, but I'm being invited in by this wonderful feminine divine. <laughs> and with that, having said all that, you have to understand that I consider her to be a much older being than, than as is ascribed in the Prosetta, the uh, daughter of Loki. I don't necessarily subscribe to that. <laughs> Now, the story of an actually creation is, is where we really break into this, this theory by the MIT physicist, Dr. Robert, Robert England. Um, the streams were called ice waves. Those which were so long came from the fountainheads that the yeasty venom upon them had hardened like the slag that runs out of the fire. These then became ice. And when the ice halted and ceased to run, then it froze over and above. But the drizzling rain that rose from the venom, so we already have this cycle of water vapor going on here, water and energy and rime and salt and all kind of the primordial soup that um, people think that uh, created life on the earth. <coughs> but the drizzling rain that rose from the venom congealed to rime, right? even still a more complex substance. And the rime increased, frost over frost, each over the other, even into the yawning void. Then spake, they called it Ganunga Gap, which faced toward the northern quarter, that dark, mysterious part of life and energy that we don't quite understand. It became filled with heaviness and masses of ice and rime, so it's continuing to build. And within drizzling rain and gust, energy, this wind energy is beginning to move things around. Uh, now it was lighted by those sparks and glowing masses which flew out of Muspelheim. Just as cold arose out of Niflheim and all terrible things, so also all that looked toward Muspelheim became hot and glowing. So you have this collection of... Well, let me continue. When the breath of heat met the rime, so that it melted and dripped, life was quickened. From the yeast drops by the power of that which sent the heat and became a man's form, and that man was named Ymir. But the Rhine giants called him Algolimir, and thence came the race of giants, blah, blah, blah. So... We have a continuation. Once the process begins, there's no stopping it. It continues to, to, to build upon itself. It builds upon itself for a reason, a very specific reason. <sighs> the idea of a primordial soup being struck with heat, cosmic rays, or lightning to begin life has been a much bandied about theory for many decades now. And it started in 1952 with the miller Yuri. They, Ure, they subjected a mix of what he believed to be the primary existing elements in the environment of our world. Water, methane, ammonia, and hydrogen. He used heat, and later on he simulated a volcanic eruption several years after that, and then still later electricity, like lightning. From this experiment, they were able to synthesize complex amino acids, about 25 of them. That's about it. They didn't go any further than that, and possibly more from this mix, but no life, really. From nothing, the mix of rime and heat produced the building blocks of life, but no actual life in this Miller-Urey experiment. But I think he won the Nobel Prize for it. So today, another cat come up with an idea. He's from MIT. His name is Dr. Jer is Jeremy England. I've, I've, uh, it's in the bibliography of this new book. He's got a new theory that revolves around entropy and the second law of thermodynamics. And it seems to correctly outline what happens when the breath of heat, Muspelheim and the sparks in the Ganun Gap, meets the rhyme and is quickened by the geister drops. <laughs> now all of a sudden something very interesting is happening here. It does so by using a formula, using established physics that suggests that when a group of atoms, the yeast drops, is driven by an external energy source, the power of that which was sent the heat, and is surrounded by a bath such as the complex salt solution of rime, it will form more and more complex patterns that most effectively dissipate or make use of the energy. And so begins the flows of energies which are so important for us to understand. Like I said in the beginning, this is where we find the universe operating according to the laws of physics and the principles of entropy. Read it however you will, but I find an amazing correlation betw between the two ideas I've just written about. Now it gets really interesting. So, 
His law of entropy suggests that as if you shine a rock on a uh, on a if you shine a light on a pool of water long enough, pretty soon you're going to be shining a light on a plant. The the atoms that are in this pool will continually form more and more complex structures to dissipate the energy that is being shined upon them. And we find, and it really supports Darwinian ideas pretty much by the fact that we are designed to withstand the energies of this world. Our sun, our skin sweats in the sun, our eyes see colors, our smells, our senses, everything is designed to operate best in the world we live in, right? Our body dissipates, it handles the heat, the energies that we consume, it handles them best to keep us motivated to do something. And it may simply be moving towards that doorway. Who knows? But this, the research from this Jeremy England, and I encourage you to look it up, really helps us understand this next phase of the origin story or this creation idea in Norse mythology. <laughs> because now, now when he's, this great giant has formed to dissipate all of this energy that's filling this void, a sweat came upon him. So he began to dissipate the heat being placed upon him by sweating it out. And there grew under his left hand a man and a woman. So now there's two more organisms to help make use of all this energy that's coming his way. And one of his feet began a sign with the other, and thus the race of giants come. So as this one organism, so from the cellular level, it, it forms more and more complex organisms to dissipate the energy that's being thrust upon it, all the way up to this gigantic organism <coughs> is forming more and more complex organisms along with it to help deal with all the energy that's coming its way. The, the way these two go hand in glove, for me, helps deal with a, a, a huge amount of, well, I'll just ignore that. See, I did plenty of that in Christianity. Well, I just won't pay attention to that part because it doesn't really suit me. Now, all of a sudden, I've got some reasons here that kind of line up with modern science as to how this really works. <laughs> and it continues on. See, we see an example of ever more complicated collections of atoms designed to dissipate the energy affecting them. But it is the name of this being which is the most interesting. And this is where I remembered what Sean said. See, emir means, depending upon who you ask, screamer, whiner, to cry, twin, or as some sources say, he is an echo of a primordial being reconstructed in Pi mythology. This distant ancient ancestor formed of fire and rhyme was oftentimes referred to with a name that described some kind of energy, a sound to be precise. And sound energy travels as a wave. All energy travels as a wave. I referred to it as a flow of energy in life and the love of life. And true to form, according to this hypothesis, new forms begin to emerge to make the most use of and gather the sustenance from the energy being applied to them. New forms of giants emerge from under his left hand between his feet as he begins to sweat. His body finds a new way to dissipate the energy. I think all of this comes across as some pretty interesting stuff. But how do we will get to how it might be of use in your faith shortly. Right now, though, we see the first expression of those flows of energy I'm so fond of talking about. <laughs> he said, where dwelt Ymir? Where did he find sustenance? Straight away after the rhyme, rhyme dripped, there sprang from it the cow called Aduma. Four streams of milk ran from her udders, and she nourished Ymir. Wherewithal was the cow nourished? And Horror said, she licked the ice blocks, which were salty. And the first day that she licked the blocks, there came forth from the blocks in the evening a man's hair. The second day a man's head. The third day the whole man was there. His name was Buri. And he was fair of feature, great and mighty. He begat a son called Bor, who wedded the woman named Besla, the daughter of Bullthorn the giant, and they had three sons. One was Odin, the second Billy, and the third Vey. And this is my belief that he, Odin, with his brothers, must be ruler of heaven and earth. We hold that he must be so called. So is that man called whom we know to be mightiest and most worthy of honor, and you will do well to let him be so called. So he earned the title. Don't try to take it from him. He will open a can of whoop-ass. 
<laughs> but back to the theory. Now a new and more complex life form emerges, Aldumla. Like most of the herbivores of this world, she makes use of something which we cannot utilize for sustenance. Those great herds of animals which roam the earth in their massive migrations make most of the use of the abun most abundant species of vegetation available, grass. Something we can't do a thing with. The animal grazes on a true wonder of science and nature. It has designed a system which will make the most use of the sunlight beaming down on it. It is handling and dispersing that energy using its chlorophyll-filled cellular structure. The fibrous texture is resilient. It uses the sunlight, the earth, and the rain which falls from the sky to continue to grow. It generates oxygen. It disperses that energy into something else that another creature might make use of. <laughs> Many of these grasses also depend upon seasonal fires to help with the dispersal of their seeds. In short, grasses make use of and disperse almost all of the various energies encountered on the surface of this planet. And we can't do a thing with this abundance. Though we might make use of wheat or rice, grasses in and of themselves are of no use to us. We have a lawn we've got to mow. Our bodies won't digest it in any meaningful manner to provide our bodies with what needs to grow and become strong. But those herds of herbivores can, and we can make use of the products they provide. Once their bodies have processed and dispersed that energy as fertilizer, muscle, bone, sinew, now we might avail ourselves of that energy. Aldumla is an example of that process. Ymir cannot sustain himself on the salty brine, but he will most certainly remain healthy and strong drinking the milk of this great cow, a process which continues to this day. Humans have followed great herds across the prairies and mountain grazing pastures for as long as there have been humans. Mammoths, elk, aurochs, camels, deer, antelope, bison followed a seasonal migration route. They moved according to the flows of the energy across this earth. Following the warmth of the sun and the rains, the flows of great rivers where plants thrive, <coughs> they, they do their best to make the most of the energy supplied to them. This is when they bloom. It is said the Buddha gazed upon a flower for some time under a special tree, and after a time he simply smiled. This is when he achieved the state of nirvana no longer simply following, but now understanding. And our lore provides something along the lines of that understanding, and it lines up with science. <laughs> Animals and plants may see and respond to these flows of energy, but humans have a powerful ability to control them, right? In today's world, our thoughts are almost as automatic as actions of the fauna which inhabit this world. The instant we take control of these thoughts, utilize the energies around us, we begin to shape the world as we simultaneously begin to change ourselves. If the flow of energy is consistent, the animals will reproduce in order to make the most use of that energy. Just like Ymir with what's following out his, his sons under his hand and in his feet, new life forms are, are developing to make the most of this energy. And the predators who follow them will do the same, dispersing, changing, and creating with energy which flows in abundance undreamed of all over this world, this world and many others. So back to the beginning, Buri has a son we call Bor, and he weds Besla, and they have three sons, Odin, Vili, and Ve. The abundance must be magnificent as one becomes two and two becomes three. And then things begin to get interesting. <laughs> Amazing things happen about the true power of this faith and way of life begin to emerge. Concepts which are repeated throughout the lore with reassuring regularity. The interesting idea that our story of creation lines up hand in glove with modern science is the kind of thing this human movement along the spiritual flows or spiritual flower of energy requires to assure its future. Our responsibility is to once again align ourselves with that flow while maintaining the awareness that it will all change in an instant. The sons of Bor slew Ymir the giant. And this is where the sons of Bor, meaning the young or the son, represents the spiritual youth of humanity changing, harnessing, or attempting to destroy an energy, Ymir being a representation of a sound wave, thank you Sean, to suit their own needs. 
The sons of Bor become gods and are known as such from here on out. They leave the base existence of the giant behind them, the hunter-gatherer, <laughs> and they become something much more. It is a pattern repeated when Cone Rig learns the language of the birds and the knowledge of the runes to shed the cone and earn the right to be called Rig himself. It is that is that gift really within us? The ability to earn that right? You bet it is. Lo, where he fell, there gushed forth so much blood out of his wounds that with it they all drowned. All the race of the rhyme giants, save that one whom giants call Bergamir, escaped with his household. There's your flood myth. He went upon his ship and his uh, wife uh. with him, and they were safe there. And from them were come the race of rhyme giants. Bergamir means bench or bench mill or literally cement. The passage hints at the fact that this disruptive process almost got out of control, much like our usage of energy. Most forms of energy are dangerous to human life in many of its forms. Humans have adapted to observe the visible spectrum of light with our eyes. Our ears make the most use of sound waves. Our skin protects us from ultraviolet waves like wavelengths of energy. We sweat to deal with heat. We use electricity for all of those things. For, to light our home, to heat and warm our home, to now power our cars. In short, our bodies have not only adapted and evolved to handle the energies of this earth, but to manipulate them for our own use as well. Now all of a sudden, there's a real neat correlation between what the sons of Bohr did and what we're doing. <laughs> what we see, hear, and touch produces astounding effects in the very systems our bodies are comprised of. They make us feel better, or in love, or tired, or refreshed. Our heartbeats quicken, and chemicals are pumped into our body based on the input from this, from this, from this sensory input. The great problem with this, and why we are not earning the right to become rig or, or not earning the right to be called rig is that for many billions of people when they get lost in their own minds and addicted to those chemicals the body doesn't know what the mind is thinking isn't really happening it simply responds we'll deal with that later in the book that's going to be a real good chapter for the giants those who could not adapt to this act of harnessing an energy created an environment which resulted in the destruction of their world perhaps this is the world the volus the vulva that talk to Odin is talking about when she speaks in the Voluspa. When we get to what the creation of the world looks like, and some folks will tell you that this is the creation of Yord and possibly Niord as well, but whatever the case, what we find is a breakdown of a world which organizes according to our sensory input. We see an arranging of the world into something which might make sense to our minds. But this does not mean that this is all there is to the world. <laughs> what was done then by Bor's son, if thou believe that they be gods? Har, meaning high, replied, In this matter they took, there is no little to be said. They took Ymir and bore him into the middle of the yawning void, and made of him the earth, of his blood the sea, and the waters. The land was made of his flesh, and the crags of his bones, gravel and stones they fashioned from his teeth, and his grinders, and from those bones that were broken. High is the first aspect of Odin. He is referred to as high, and he describes the simple layout. They filled the gap with land and sea. In much the same manner, men will see a plot of land and decide to arrange it. They will impose their will upon this original order of things. Never mind that they are, there are complex processes of life occurring, processes which he directly benefits from, benefits from as trees and shrubs process sunlight and carbon dioxide to produce oxygen. As microbes break down the dead and decaying leaves, limbs, and other life forms which have run their lot in life. As trees produce shade, fruit, firewood, and shelter for game, animals, and birds, building materials, so on and so forth. He will eradicate it all to build a children's playground for the community so people can get outside. <laughs> so think about that for a second. Man, with his lack of understanding of the order of things, aligned in a necessary manner to fill the gap and support life, has misdirected his own will. The knowledge of the language of birds, the understanding of the flows of energy, have been superseded by new flows of energy. Man's efforts transformed into a new building material of his own. 
And we call the physical man manifestation of this blind spiritual effort money. Now, we are just now returning to a point in time where technology might help us to utilize the ancient flows of energy to better live in alignment with this world. Great concrete jungles have bankrupt mankind just as it has done in the past. Think about all those ancient temples that are abandoned and we're wondering, what are they for? Wonderful, huge, magnificent structures with amazing, accurate alignments to the solar system, but they are abandoned. Somehow, some way, whatever happened, that culture went bankrupt, building structures on a planet that didn't necessarily need them. <laughs> Great concrete jungles have bank bankrupt mankind just as it has done in the past, to a point where he cannot survive the world he lives in, and must pay someone else to live comfortably upon it. If we do it right, we might make use again of the sun's energy with solar. We might understand how to harvest rainwater or the wind and grow our own food. This return to Ossetru and the current technological trends in energy usage are quietly encouraging men to once again take the responsibility for his own well-being on this world. A world which has been rocked by countless world-ending tragedies before he even raised his head to count the stars. In the event of this great destructive forces from meteorites, solar flares, earthquakes, volcanoes, and the like, it will be the indigenous people who survive and rebuild. Once again, mankind will have to start all over and rediscover what we are talking about here. And it will be something like the runes which show them the way. Much of this concept is outlined in my book, Life and the Love of Life. If you haven't read it, I highly encourage you to do it. And if you like it, tell people you like it. <laughs> now, Yafenhar said, Of the blood which ran and welled forth freely out of his wounds, they made the sea. When they had formed and made firm the earth together and laid the sea in a ring about her, and it may well seem a hard thing to most men to cross over it. Now we see equally high tell us of the liquid which binds all things. The sea is set in a ring about the earth, a solid is surrounded by water. Most of the time we might think of mud, but such is not necessarily the case. The rune lagus, which means water, is that ancient and primal symbol of the substance which binds all things. Water provides support for the cell structure. If it were to become desiccated, our very being would dry up and blow away. Think about all the mummies in the desert, they're awfully dry. Every living thing which processes energy is composed largely of water. It happens to be an excellent conduit for all forms of energy, including spiritual energy. Water is the medium for the energy reactions in the cells of every living thing. It is the solvent in which all various byproducts of chemicals and enzymatic functions are transported. Excuse me. <coughs> all cells make the most use of energy they are accustomed and developed for. Water is the conduit which ensures that life continues to take place. And here we seem to have something of an understanding of this process. It is interesting to see this fascinating reference to water's ability to hold everything together and support life in this ancient tale, and used it to navigate its way through the science of understanding and theory to where we are today. To tell the truth, it was probably a farmer. Then said 3D, they took his skull also and made of it heaven and set it up over the earth with four corners and under each corner they set a dwarf. The names of these are east, west, north, and south. Then they, are, then they took the glowing embers and sparks that burst forth and had been cast out of Muspelheim and set them in the midst of the yawning void. So they continued to bring energy in. In the heavens, both above and below, to illumine heaven and earth, they assigned places to all fires. To some in heaven, some wandered free under the heavens. Nevertheless, to these also they gave a place, and shaped them courses. It is said in old songs that from these days were reckoned in the tale of years told. The Voluspa says the sun knew not where she had her housing. That is an interesting line there as the in the in the wintertime and in the summertime, especially in the summertime when you go far north, the sun never really goes below the horizon. And it was kind of this imagining of the uh, of Suna with her hands kind of laying over the edge of the world, just kind of hanging out, <laughs> didn't really know where she was. The moon knew not what might he had, controlling the tides and so on and so forth, and the werewolves. The stars knew not 
where stood their places. And so much of these ancient buildings and structures are aligned with the stars and we use the stars for navigation. And indeed the North Star uh, is a representation of Tiwaz or Tyr or Deuce as it was in the, in the, pro, in the Pi, uh, in the Pi faiths and religions. It's still a guiding symbol for noblemen as early as the, as the Middle Ages in the, <laughs> thus was it ere the earth was fashioned. All of these energy places were set where they would flow and support what was going on in the world that had been surrounded and bound and contained by water. Now it is third which tells us how energy was dispersed, dispersed through this new creation. A shield was erected for us to call the sky. Four directions are named after the dwarves, which support this great cover. I don't think people understand when they raise that hammer to north, south, east, and west, they're calling on them dwarves to solidify that protection over us. <laughs> the sun and moon and stars are put to use as they are needed for the comfort of this new world, just as we put light and heat to use in our own homes. Once again, that's a striking similarity to me. They take some energy from a greater source and realign it for their own use. We're doing the same thing today every time we flick a light switch. Some people would split hairs about the scale, but we aren't far off with terrifying potential of nuclear explosions, right? Even one or two warhead-sized explosions would radically alter the way and manner we would need to live over the entire Earth. Our beings are not designed to handle that level of energy nor has anything else on this planet developed an ability to properly handle these types of radiation. We're not, we weren't exposed to them. These energies destroy the cell walls of most living things. Then said Gangleri, these are great tidings which I now hear. That is a wondrous great piece of craftsmanship and cunningly made. How is the earth contrived? And Har answered, she is, she, Yord, is ring shaped without and round about her lieth the deep sea. And along the strand of that sea, they gave land to the race of giants for habitation. But on the inner earth, they made a citadel round about the world against the hostility of the giants. And for their citadel, they raised up the brows of Emir the giant and called that place Midgard. They took also his brain and cast it into the air and made from it clouds, as it is said here. The Emir's flesh, the earth was fashioned. And of his sweat the sea, crags of his bones, trees of his hair, and of his skull the sky. Then of his brows the blithe gods made Midgard for the sons of men. And of his brain the bitter mooded clouds were created. And see, with just a slight change of perception, we see the structure of a cell outlined. A cell wall with a membrane and cytoplasm. A central nucleus with energy producing chloroplasts and mitochondria. Is it a stretch to think that this ancient tale might truly be an outlining of such a concept? Maybe. Is it a stretch to see a structure which is built to make the most use of the energy which surrounds it? Not really. Like most of the lore, it is a tale concerning the dispersal of some kind of energy, and it works from the cellular to the cosmic scale. <laughs> Those bitter mooded clouds are just one more example of energy producing potential. I use them as examples of the cellular powerhouses, the mitochondria. Incidentally, mitochondrial DNA is currently being used to trace our ancestry. The backward study of how energy was been dispersed across the globe as new humans. As clouds, these brains represent yet another source of energy which will be utilized. High and low pressure flows of water vapor and air across the surface of the earth, the rain, the lightning, the wind for sailing and energy, the fact that there seems to be a reference to it and both the chaos and promise these clouds held for early traveling humans continues to amaze me, as well as reassure me that this is, there is far more here than at first meets the eye. That is the first chapter of the new book, Blind. And I'm just finished up chapter two. And it is, uh, it's even more awe-inspiring, if I do say so myself. Um, to get ready for it, I highly suggest you pick up Life and the Love of Life. Um, I appreciate everyone joining me here tonight that I could talk about this. 
I appreciate the comments I got. Thank you, Zeke. Um, and it, I just, uh, I appreciate the time that, that everyone jumped in on this. So I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up and um, we'll do this again very soon. We might do a weekly thing or I might tie it into Tuesday nights when I present at, uh, at Spiritual Rose. <laughs> Not doing one this Tuesday night, but next Tuesday I'm going to be in there talking maybe about, I'll probably do one on Thor because this is awfully complex and there's a lot of new people in there. So thank you all for paying attention to me tonight and uh, have a happy new year and be very careful out there.